Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Wayne Stetsky. I'll be your host this evening, and I want to welcome you all to tonight's live and interactive telephone town hall discussion. With me tonight are our guest panelists, Her Worship Deb Kozak, the Mayor of Nelson, uh, Tamara Duggan and Rod Duggan from Tamarack Dispensaries in Kimberley, and very shortly we're expecting Dean Nicholson, the Executive Director of the East Kootenai Addiction Services Society. Those of you who travel between East and West Kootenays will know some of the challenges uh, in making the trek back and forth. So if you have a question for me or our panelists, just press star three on your phone at any time. I'm very excited to be here with you. Right now we are calling thousands of your neighbors from across Kootenai, Columbia. It will take a few minutes to connect with everyone. So as we are dialing out, let me take a moment to explain how a telephone town hall works. So right now people from across Kootenai, Columbia are answering their phones and connecting to this discussion. In a way, this is like a traditional town hall where guests arrive and file in through the front door, except in place of a front door, there are thousands of phones ringing throughout Kootenai, Columbia. Once someone answers their phone, they just stay on the line to join this discussion. This telephone town hall technology enables us to reach out and talk with thousands of people from the comfort of their homes. It is a great way for me to stay connected with you and ensure you hear from me directly, ask questions live, and listen to the answers. For those of you just joining the call, welcome. This is a telephone town hall on marijuana legalization. I'm Wayne Stetsky, Member of Parliament for Kootenai, Columbia. I see we still have some more phones to call, so as we wait for everyone to join, I'd like to welcome our panelists to the call and ask them each in just a minute to give a brief statement on the issue. And again, if you have a question or comment, just press star three on your phone at any time. So I'm very interested in hearing what you think about legalization of marijuana and what is critical to include in the legislation which the government has proposed to start moving forward potentially in April or later in the fall. So as most of you know, the federal government has promised to legalize and regulate the production, sales, and access to marijuana for both medicinal and recreational use. Here in Kootenai, Columbia, this is big news. It's widely believed that our marijuana economy is one of the largest in Canada. Will legalizing the industry help it? Will regulating the industry hurt it? What effect will this have on citizens, especially on our youth? Joining me tonight are some people who have an interest in these questions and who will help us find the answers to them. And of course, I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments as well, because I want to know what you think so I can take that back to Ottawa. So for those of you just joining us on the call, we're here tonight for a special telephone town hall discussion on marijuana legalization. And if you have a question, just press star three on your phone at any time. So I'd like to turn to our panelists for a brief opening statement. And I'm going to start with Her Worship Mayor Deb Kozak, the Mayor of Nelson. Welcome, Deb. Thank you, Wayne. It's nice to be here. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm pleased to be taking part in this discussion, and I too am really interested in hearing from all of you about what you think about the legalization of marijuana. I'll give you a brief synopsis of what's happened in our city since um, this, the, the news of the legalization or possible legalization was, of the product was coming forward. We are, we've taken a bit of a different approach uh, than other communities. Some communities have said that they will wait for full legalization before allowing any dispensaries to open in their communities. In our case, we allowed dispensaries to open uh, with the anticipation that the law would be passed in a fairly short fashion. I think what I can say without a doubt is that what we've discovered is that the issue of the legalization of marijuana is quite complicated, not only at a local level, but I'm sure at the federal level as well, and has many ramifications. 
We have recently put into place a bylaw which will regulate the, the current dispensaries or the dispensaries that are open in our community. We have capped the number at six total. All current dispensaries will have to reapply to the City of Nelson uh, with a proposal uh, for business license. And then we will, uh, if successful, we will give them a temporary uh, use permit to operate. What, uh, there are more details in the, in the bylaw itself that I won't go into at this time, but what we're anticipating is that once the federal government legalizes the product, that we will either repeal or modify this bylaw to be in compli compliance with federal regulations. What I'd like to see moving forward is that the federal government really consult with local communities on how the product will be regulated and who will do that. For example, one of the recommendations that the federal government is anticipating is or is considering is that people needing medicine will be able to grow their own uh, and uh, there's that, that will be regulated as to how many plants. Local government, we'd like to know who would be regulating that. If the anticipation is that it would be at local level, we'd like to see some sharing in the revenues that are made possible from this product. I'm going to conclude my, um, that's a, one thing that I'd like to see, but I'm going to okay. conclude that so the other speakers have a chance to, chance to speak. Right, and we'll hear from the panelists briefly at the end as well. So mm -hmm. now I'd like to turn to Tamara Duggan from Tamarack Dispensaries in Kimberley. Welcome. Thank you, Wayne. And hello to all the listeners out there tonight. Um, I opened my dispensary in July 2015, and it turned out that I was the first dispensary in Canada to be issued a business license. And that was thanks in part to the unanimous support that I received from Kimberley City Council. And um, the concerns that we have about the forthcoming legislation deals around the independent ownership of dispensaries and where we would fit into that when the licensed producers want to have the monopoly on um, opening their own storefronts. And our concern is that as independents, the legislation will in fact write us completely out and um, make us illegal when in fact um, we are the ones who have been doing all the groundwork and laying the foundation. And we really just don't want to see the legislation end up killing small business and impacting the economic um, impact that we have been making in our communities. Thank you, Tamara. So we did invite the RCMP to participate uh, this evening as well, and they respectfully declined. I have to say that just watching what's been happening across Canada, uh, the current situation, which in essence is marijuana is going to be legalized for recreational uses. It is, of course, already legal for medicinal purposes. Um, at the same time, the government has said many times in Parliament that uh, the police are expected to enforce the existing laws that are in place. So we have this system where the police forces are being told to enforce existing regulations, which potentially uh, could lead to more people getting criminal records, uh, at the same time being told that uh, it's going to be legal soon. And so if you're a Crown counsel uh, trying to decide what are your priority cases that you want to bring to court, are you likely to bring marijuana cases forward or other uh, infractions of the law? So very challenging time to be in the police forces in Canada as well. So again, if you want to get in the lineup for questions, just press star three on your phone. And we're going to start with a question from Roberta from Invermere. Go ahead, Roberta. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. I just want to know where all the money is going to go. <laughs> Once it goes back to the federal government, who, who gets it and where does it go? other than in the pockets of, of the federal government. Who's Appreciate that question, and I would like to think it'll go from, uh, certainly my perspective, that it'll go towards helping uh, with homelessness, that it'll help uh, with a senior strategy to help um, ensure more seniors don't have to struggle uh, in their golden years. 
So a absolutely, but it's a fair question and one that I think uh, Canadians need to be watching going forward. Uh, potentially there is a fair bit of tax revenue that comes from uh, legalizing marijuana and where that money goes should be on the minds of Canadians. So thank you for raising that. I would like to see uh, as well that that uh, some of the that the money comes back to local communities to assist in uh, in, in many ways as uh, as Wayne just spoke about but as well I think that we're going to need some assistance in the regulation of the of the product. Uh, I don't think that uh, downloading the downloading the services that will that will be needed should should fall to the shoulders of local government. All right, and continuing on then, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to hear from Tamara from Cranbrook. Go ahead, Tamara. Hi there, <clears throat> and thank you for having me on this evening. I'm actually the CEO of the Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partner Society, and we run out of Cranbrook, BC. And our main concern is actually, because we are a pro-dispensary, municipalities like Cranbrook have opted out on allowing us to run in Cranbrook at this time, which is leaving a gap for a lot of patients that work and that are here in Cranbrook. I myself hold an ACM PR and find it difficult to sometimes get around and, and find my own medicine, but I also grow for myself. So as well as I don't want to see the craft growers and, and have everybody legitimized because we already know that there's a black market running and these people could be legitimized by actually having legalization bring the small business owners and the growers into the, uh, into the industry that they did forefront. I agree with Tamara Duggan on that. We've been out there forefronting for the cannabis community and the cannabis industry for over 10 years, most of us for two decades. And a lot of us are going to be left behind, including the fact that the police are still out busting. Many of our friends went to jail this last week because their dispensaries were shut down and closed. And I really find it appalling that we are being left to be criminals when we're not criminals. Thanks, Tamara. And absolutely, I, I think we're in the situation right now, and the best word I could use to describe it is chaos. Uh, some police forces across the country are enforcing the law as it sits, which is what the Justice Minister has directed. Other police forces are not. Some municipalities are looking to license uh, outlets and others are not. Uh, it, it is very chaotic at the moment. Uh, and uh, you know, One of the things that hopefully will happen, of course, moving forward is that uh, once everybody gets on the same page, it's just been my experience in life that the thing that hurts us the most uh, on a personal level and on a business level is uncertainty. So the sooner this uncertainty is put uh, to bed, the better, I think, for everyone. Uh, next up, we're going to hear, and thank you again, Tamara, uh, we're going to hear from Ken. Hello. Where are, you, where are you calling from, Ken? Nelson. All right. Go ahead, please. Well, I guess this has been on the books for some time now, thinking about what you're going to do with the <clears throat> with the revenue and whatnot. Um, I guess I was a little disappointed to hear you say that you you it, you hope that the money will go to um, I guess help the homeless and the and people with addictions and whatnot. Uh, what is the um, feeling in Ottawa uh, as to where this is going to go and how it's going to be used? Because if it's just going to go into general revenue. Uh, I'm not a fan. I'm a fan of legalizing the, the product, but um, unless it's used for, I think, a social reason, a social good, um, I'm not really that interested. No, very much appreciate that comment, and we'll certainly include that in our recommendations. I agree that's really important that it not disappear in general revenue. So thank you for that. And I'm, I'm going to invite uh, Dean Nicholson to uh, say a few words. Uh, in terms of introduction, uh, Dean is the Executive Director of the East Kootenai Addiction Services Society. Welcome, Dean. So if you wouldn't mind, like one of the things that I hear, and if you want to just include it in, uh, in your opening statement, um, I hear from some quite concerned constituents that they consider marijuana to be a gateway drug, which is something I'm sure you've uh, heard before. So I'd be interested in your comments. You have, of course, been involved in uh, addiction uh, services and serving clientele in that field for many, many years. So very interested in your perspective on legalizing marijuana, 
um, and what potentially might go into the legislation that would give you a sense of comfort. Sure. Thanks very much, Wayne, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, glad to be part of this panel. Uh, yeah, I've been working in the addictions field for coming on 28 years now. Uh, in answer to your first question regarding uh, marijuana as a gateway drug, uh, that's often bantered around as a concern for uh, having greater access to marijuana. But in fact, there's no real uh, evidence that using marijuana is going to make people move on to uh, more what we consider more risky or harder drugs. It's certainly true that most people who might be using uh, Heavier drugs probably have used marijuana beforehand, but it's not a link that if they use marijuana, they're naturally going to move on to something else. So I think we could not be concerned that it's necessarily going to lead to anywhere else. Um, I think uh, our agency, uh, the addictions field in general, is, is quite excited about the possibility of, of legalizing marijuana, moving it away from a, a, a criminal kind of framework, a law and order framework, into more of a, a public health sort of framework, looking at regulating it in the same ways that, uh, or similar ways that alcohol and tobacco might be regulated. Clearly, marijuana is a popular drug of choice. It's the second most popular drug being used worldwide after alcohol. Uh, we know that there are risks associated with use, but a large uh, chunk of the population wants to use, and taking a law and order approach hasn't uh, changed that, that use pattern. In fact, use usage levels have probably been fairly stable for a long time. So a different way of approaching this issue is, is uh, very much needed. Thank you. And again, uh, so I have with me Mayor Deb Kozak of Nelson uh, from a municipal perspective, Dean Nicholson uh, from the Addiction Services Society, and uh, Tamara and Rod from Tamarack Dispensaries in Kimberley. So you can feel free to address your questions to any of the panelists as well. So next up, we're going to hear from James. So James, where are you calling from this evening? James, are you there? We hello. Seem to, hello, James. Hello. Calling from from Caslo. All right. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, can you, do you have a question for the panelists? Well, I guess it's not so much a question, more a point. Um, I suspect that if the softer drugs, the, the marijuana and the, you know, whatever natural plants are made available to the public um, without any criminal concern, hard drugs, the, you know, the new fentanyl and the whatever's going on on the streets these days um, wouldn't be such a, such a big issue for us. So you're in favor of uh, legalizing marijuana? Well, I, I don't know if legal, I don't know what the terms are. I just expect that there's a vast difference between people that are on, say, the hard drugs, the fentanyl and stuff, and people that are, you know, I mean, if it was readily available, people would be happy to, you know, enjoy that and not have to, you know, do whatever they have to do to get the hard drugs. Dean, you know, given your experience, what do you think? Uh, it's an interesting point, James, although in my experience, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I think people often tend to have uh, drugs of choice or classes of drugs of choice, and the people who might prefer to use marijuana recreationally are probably quite happy to do that. The, the people that we find that might be getting into more difficulty uh, either using marijuana in a way that becomes problematic for them or using other drugs that become problematic there's often uh, other issues at play for them. And so I'm not sure that just having uh, marijuana more readily available is going to stop people from uh, developing problems with other drugs. Uh, I think that, that will continue to happen, but for different reasons, not because marijuana is more or less available. Thank you very much for that question. And we're going to move on to Charlie. We are trying to get in as many people tonight as possible. So. Uh, we, we will kind of try and move on fairly quickly after the que questions are answered. So, Charlie. Hey. Thanks, Hello, uh, thanks for having this great event. I think uh, this is the first time I've ever seen something like that, so congratulations to you. I, my advice, I think, uh, is what is the role of the federal government versus the federal uh, provincial versus the municipal government? And, and you as a Federal M and our, our federal MP need to think about that. 
We've got lots of models selling liquor and tobacco out there. Uh, so what is the appropriate role of the federal government? Uh, when is there an uh, appropriate role of a provincial and municipal government? Uh, anyways, that, that's kind of my thinking. And, and I think that's an excellent point, Charlie. The federal government uh, potentially has a role, of course, across Canada in terms of legalizing it or not. But the provincial governments ultimately will determine where it gets sold, uh, potentially the age that uh, will, it'll be sold at in different uh, provinces. As you know, right now there is a difference in terms of the age that you can buy alcohol legally in different provinces as well. So very much a, a role for the provincial government and very much uh, responsibility ultimately in the municipal government for licensing these outlets. So absolutely right, all three levels of government have to be engaged and hopefully talking to one another as this legislation moves forward. So thank you very much for that point. Uh, next up we have Larry from Cranbrook. Good evening, Larry. Hi. Yeah, my question is, Is uh, does alcohol, sorry, does marijuana affect uh, driving? Uh, the police have a way of detecting wh whether you're driving while intoxicated with either breathalyzer or uh, blood test. Can they detect if if marijuana affects driving, can they detect that you are quote-unquote high on marijuana? So some relatively good news there. When I was uh, chatting with the RCMP about being part of the panel, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada just made a decision that says that RCMP and other uh, police forces do have the right and the ability to determine impairment from marijuana and other drugs as well. Uh, that there was a real important question that went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada to get the answer. So uh, the police forces will be developing uh, a standard set of criteria the same way they did with alcohol to determine whether somebody is impaired or not impaired uh, moving forward. So I, I know they were My understanding that. is that they're already testing um, uh, a, a, a device that will measure uh, levels and they're, that's it, they're testing it in Vancouver. Dean? Yeah, a couple points there, uh, Wayne. Uh, absolutely, marijuana does affect driving. Uh, it certainly it creates an impairment that increases the risk for, uh, for accident. Uh, probably something at least twice as likely to have an accident under the influence of marijuana as sober. And uh, marijuana is the second most common drug detected in fatal MBAs after alcohol. Uh, and there is uh, a, a standard behavioral assessment that our, certain RCMP are trained to do that we're uh, at roadside. Uh, and depending on how a person uh, passes or fails that test, they would then move on to get a, a blood test to look for levels of uh, marijuana in the system. One of the issues that's difficult to, that hasn't been fully determined yet is what level of marijuana in the bloodstream would constitute uh, legal impairment. That's still something mm -hmm. that's You still have to determine yeah. that, right. Thank you very much, both of you, for mm -hmm. your input. Uh, we'll take our next question from Philomena, and then I'm actually going to put all of you to work on a quick poll. So Philomena, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, well, I, I don't think I'd like to be marijuana um, uh, available for everybody. Uh, however, I went downtown today, and every other um, block, I kind of uh, smell skunk, and that was people uh, or, um, or kids or whatever smell, uh, smoking marijuana, and I don't appreciate that. And which community are you from? Um, Nelson. I'm Nelson. Hi, Philomena. This is Mayor Deb Kozak. Um, that makes me very unhappy to hear that. Uh, I would hope that you would phone, phone with our own police enforcement agency. One of the things that we are actually um, looking at regulating, Nelson has a no smoking bylaw. We don't care what you're smoking, uh, whether it's cigarettes or marijuana, whatever. It wasn't cigarettes, it was uh, a stinking 
Yeah. So um, definitely phone the police when you uh, when you detect that. And um, that again, when I think about some of the legislation that needs to pass as well, we uh, when, especially when it, uh, if this, if marijuana is legalized for recreational use, one of the things that's going to come forward to local government is the possibility of what people call vape lounges. That's not something that we have endorsed at all. Uh, the mar marijuana dispensaries that are currently in operation, the product is not to be consumed on the premises or outside the premises. People can buy it and then they are, it's expected that they would take it home or do consume elsewhere, but definitely not on the public street. So Thank thanks for that. Thank you. Um, do call the police when you, uh, when, don't, don't hesitate. Well, I don't know if I will do that, but I do not appreciate to uh, have that smell. Yeah. Um, one thing I can add to it is there's a bit of a human rights issue that comes along, whereas when it is a medical use, if you tell somebody they can't smoke it, you're telling somebody they can't take their medicine. And that's really where a big stumbling block comes in when it comes to smoking it in public or smoking it in a smoke pit when you're at a concert or something like that. And that's, there is, I do agree you don't want to smell it on every single corner, but sometimes it can be a medical purpose that somebody's doing it for. If it's PTSD or an anxiety thing, they need to deal with it right now, not go find somewhere where they're able to. Thanks, Rod. And of course, uh, marijuana for medical purposes uh, is already legal in Canada. Uh, and of course, the What's coming up in this legislation is basically legalizing marijuana for recreational uh, uses as, as well. So um, I, I want to just go to a quick poll here. Those of you that haven't, haven't taken the opportunity, the federal government did put together a panel uh, last fall uh, to go out and talk to some Canadians at least on terms of what they thought should happen with legalizing marijuana. They put together a report. Uh, it's called the McClellan Report. It's available uh, if you just Google uh, federal government report on marijuana. And one of the recommendations in there, it was that its uh, legal age be standardized potentially at an age of 19 years across Canada. So here's your opportunity to get involved this evening and participate even if, uh, if you run out of time to get to your questions. So here we go. Government is leaning towards a minimum age of 19 for the legal purchase of marijuana for recreational purposes. Do you think 19 is the correct minimum age? So, and I will repeat this, but if you think 19 is correct, press, press 1 on your phone. Press 2 on your phone if you think the minimum age should be higher than 19 and press three on your phone if you think the minimum age should be lower. So let me say that one more time. Press one on your phone if you think 19 is the correct minimum wage to purchase marijuana products. Press two on your phone if you think the minimum age should be higher. And press three on your phone if you think the minimum age should be lower. We'll have the results in just a few minutes, so I will let you know uh, how the people online voted. And now let's go straight to our next question. Uh, this is, uh, we would like to hear now from Mel. Hello, Wayne. How are you doing? How are you? And where are you calling from, Mel? Uh, Salvo. All right. Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to know what work is being done on removing uh, marijuana from the criminal code. You know, it's an excellent question, and it's one that we've been pushing on in Parliament. We really think that marijuana should be decriminalized so that uh, we're not adding to the list of people with a criminal record for simple possession. Uh, we have been pushing, we being the NDP, have been pushing the government on that for the last year. Uh, it could have happened and can happen immediately. We don't know why the government is waiting to act on it, but we very much believe that it should be decriminalized. So. Uh, encourage, we'll certainly in include that in the report, uh, but decriminalization could happen and should have happened a while ago, uh, regardless of how this legalization moves forward. Thank you for the question. So I would encourage everyone, if you haven't had the opportunity to 
uh, go and, and read the government's report. I would encourage you to do that. There's a lot of interesting recommendations. One of the ones that was alluded to by Mayor Kozak up front, uh, it suggests in the report that every Canadian should be able to grow up to four pot plants in your own home, uh, but it can't be any higher than 100 centimeters tall. And Mayor Kozak's question was really quite valid, really. So who's going to enforce that? Uh, who's <laughs> going to come knocking on your door to count your plants and bring a tape measure? Uh, but that, that's one of the recommendations. So, but there are many other very serious uh, recommendations. And I, I guess you're serious about that as well. I just have a hard time figuring out how that one's going to work. So the results, uh, sorry, the results of the poll. 53% um, of you who, who voted think that 19 is the correct age. 36% thought it should be younger than 19. And 11% uh, say it should be older than 19. This is very, very interesting. Thank you for taking the time to participate in that poll. So now we want to hear from Paula from the east shore of Kootenai Lake. Hi. Hi, Paula. Hi, how are you? Thank you Very for well. uh, holding this town meeting. Am I on? You are, yes. Okay. Um, I have a couple of concerns uh, uh, regarding the legalization, and that is about the U.S. border in particular, who uh, has uh, barred a lot of people who are medical marijuana users from going ever to the States ever again. And I know this has been a, a big thing for a lot of people in Canada. And we really have to do something about that, as well as the people who do have records from the past for marijuana use. Um, as a person with a psychology degree, I can tell you honestly that addiction is a disease and the substance doesn't really matter. Um, they should be treating the addiction and not the substance at all. Um, there's a lot of people in this world that are ruining it because they're addicted to greed, but uh, we unfortunately don't put those people in rehab. Um, also, I think I would speak for everybody else that uh, four plants is absolutely ridiculous unless you want to really increase the power bills. Um, I prefer to uh, grow outside in the summertime and grow for the, you know, as enough for a whole year without using a lot of power, and that would kind of ruin that. Um, and we also very much are afraid of having monsanto pot. We need our local people who have the knowledge um, and small businesses dealing with this on a local level because they're the ones that know the patients, know what they need, and they have the expertise. So I'm very much against them um, corporatizing uh, the sale of marijuana. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, any, any comments from people around the table? Well, I would just like to say that I'm totally in agreement with that. Um, the recent recalls of the cannabis product from the licensed producers because of pesticides and other harmful chemicals is very alarming. And I can speak for myself and probably many other small independent dispensaries when I say that we're buying our product from growers who put love and care into their plants. And the last thing, and they use the product themselves the last thing they're going to do is put on chemicals in order to boost production so that they can make more money because they know what the harmful stuff can do to a person's body. And for all of the small growers and the uh, underground industry that currently exists, it's a real concern for us when we think about um, if the government were to say it, you only can buy your product from the big licensed producers. And that's, that's our big concern. Thank you, Tamara. And Dean? I think a couple points that, uh, that need to be considered, though, is that uh, the issue of how, how to standardize the amount of active ingredients in the products, whether that's for medicinal reasons or for recreational use, and certainly there's a wide variety of uh, marijuana strains that are being grown now that have various levels of the active ingredient THC or the active ingredient cannabidiol, and th they have very different effects on people. Uh, you know, so the way we have it currently with uh, pharmaceutical products or alcohol, we know what the active dose is, how much is in, in the purchase, and I think that's going to be an issue that's going to need to be resolved if we're looking at either a medicinal or a recreational market that there needs to be a way of standardizing how much of what ingredient people are actually getting. 
and, and those that are licensed to produce medical marijuana now, it really is a science. I, I met with the uh, some of the companies in Ottawa, um, and absolutely, they can balance the percentages between the two uh, ingredients to match uh, basically medical conditions uh, reasonably well. So it, it was interesting to see that it is a science. Um, I'd like to hear from Steve from Revelstoke. Welcome, Revelstoke. Uh, Thank you, Wayne, and uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. Good on you. Um, my question is about the insurance industry. Have you had any input from the life insurance industry? Used to be there was a time when if, uh, if there was a blood test done when you were applying for life insurance, your premium could either go way up or you could be uh, turned down completely uh, if you had traces of THC in your blood. Well, that, that's news to uh, certainly to me, and I think to many of the people around the table. So I uh, haven't heard. Um, from um, there's um, a couple of the insurance companies. I can't remember the names of them right off the top. Sun Life would be one of them. That recently rated smoking marijuana as less of a hazard than smoking tobacco, and does not. Uh, they don't beat up on your life insurance rates if you admit to using the product. And that's starting to be a little bit more prevalent among a few of the conversations I've seen with the insurance industries. Interesting aspect that certainly I hadn't thought about. This is a very complicated issue. Uh, the more I learn, the more I, less I know. Um, next up, we'd like to hear from Joshua from Nelson. Yes, hello, you hear me? We sure can. Go ahead, Joshua. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering if there are any plans uh, in place or any ideas or developments or ideas of getting grants, partnerships, et cetera, to start um, instituting some kind of, uh, um, I shouldn't say instituting, maybe the wrong word, but to start plantations where so that we can get some good jobs in the West Kootenays. I know a lot of people that are quite desperate these days to pay the rent, and uh, it would be good to have uh, sustainable um well-paying jobs. Um, thank you very much for everything tonight. You're welcome. I'm going to let Mayor Kozak. Uh, Hi, Joshua. That. that was a really great question. Um, I uh, serve on the executive of the Union of British Columbia Municipalities, and there's a there's a, a task force that one of our members serves on. Uh, um, Councillor Kerry Jang from uh, Vancouver. You might have heard his name. Um, one of the things that the federal government is doing is uh, they're, they're spending most of their time on regulating the product and uh, that, that is going to come forward. I think that if we are looking to have uh, a broader or more uh, lenient system towards growers and expanding uh, how that works, that would be a message that I would encourage you to take to the federal government. At this time, Although medical marijuana is legal, as you probably are aware, only licensed growers are able to provide that to, pe to people, and that's through the mail. And so that's the way people are told that they can consume. But I know that there are people like you uh, who could definitely use some jo uh, good jobs, and I think that there's probably some expertise in this area that uh, could be shared with, with the federal government in terms of quality of the product and regulation. Thanks for your call. One of the recommendations from the McLennan report uh, related to economic development also encourages engaging with Indigenous First Nations governments and representative organizations to explore opportunities for their participation potentially in the cannabis market. So another aspect to uh, economic uh, development and, and concerns. So next up we're going to hear from Nolan from Invermere. Welcome, Nolan. Nolan, are you there? Well, we're waiting to then move on since we can't find Nolan. Uh, we're going to hear from Jim from Nelson. Are you there, Jim? My question is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a couple of parts question. I understand that where it has been legalized in Colorado, for example, that taxation dollars has not been realized. And secondly, um, if you can grow four plants, for example, in your, in, in your home or in your garden, I don't understand how 
we're going to be able to regulate marijuana, how much THC is in it and all that kind of stuff. When anybody can grow it in their house, how will the, how will the enforcement officers know that this was in a legal operation or, uh, you know, like, how are you going to regulate it? If I don't understand how that's going to happen. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. Uh, say there are a series of recommendations in that report. Uh, what will actually end up in the legislation, I hope, will be influenced by conversations like we are having here around Kootenai, Columbia tonight and the feedback that we provide. Um, so that, that's certainly important feedback. You know, Jim, uh, this is Deb Kozak. I, uh, my understanding about the heavy, giving people the ability to grow their own legally is specifically for people who are uh, fin it's, it's around financial impact and making sure that people have access to what they need while taking away some of that uh, spending or, or taking away the expense of the product uh, if you have to buy it uh, rather than grow it. I think, too, that uh, what I understand from the federal government is that they are trying to have an, uh, such abundance of the product uh, with growers that it brings the price down, which makes it less lucrative for organized crime. So in my view, that's not such a bad idea, but I totally agree with your question. How on earth would, we, would that be regulated if you're growing your own? And I'll just read quickly from the report. Uh, the task force recommends allowing personal cultivation of cannabis for non-medical purposes with the following conditions. A limit of four plants per residence, a maximum height limit of 100 centimeters on the plants, prohibition on dangerous manufacturing processes, reasonable security measures to prevent theft and youth access, and oversight and approval by local authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, potentially problematic. Dean? And I think also, you know, uh, people can make their own beer and wine at home, and most people choose not to do that, uh, would rather go out and buy, uh, buy it from a, a store. So my guess is that there may be people who would like to grow their own marijuana, but most people, if they're choosing to use, would probably just rather have a more convenient way of picking it up when they need to. Anyway, great, great question. So now we'll go back and see if we can get hold of Nolan from Invermere. Are you there? We're there. Are you there, Nolan? Yeah, I'm here. Can All you right. hear me? Question, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, I'm wondering, my first question was, do you think there's been enough scientific work done on this? So I'm going to turn perhaps to, to Dean. Um, you know, there, I can tell you from my own experience, there, the uh, federal uh, physicians have not necessarily uh, signed on to it yet. They thought there should be more study, more uh, uh, science, I guess, before they could formally support it. Um, and can, Dean, would you want to jump sure. in for a sec? Yeah, a great question, Nolan. I, I think uh, part of what's happened, uh, getting good scientific evidence, uh, both are around the medicinal uses and also the potential risks from uh, recreational mm -hmm. use, is that while marijuana had been uh, under the criminal code, it was much harder for research to be done. There is research uh, being done now looking at uh, uh, risks associated with uh, uh, adolescent use but, uh, and fairly significant potential risks for adolescents uh, using marijuana. Uh, you know, better research being done looking at the medical benefits of marijuana to try to have better uh, double-blind kinds of tests to, to, to see what the potential benefits are. So that there's more happening, but I think there's a lot more that can still be done at a fairly early stage in having good good solid science to back up the, the risks benefits. And just to demonstrate quickly how complicated this issue is, there have been research uh, recently that suggests that uh, our brains are most actively growing until the age of 25 and that the use of cannabis, particularly overuse, will impact a growing brain. Uh, initially I was a little insulted. I wondered what about my brain since I'm a little older than 25. But it's a serious issue, and the research suggests that it does have impact. Um, the panel still recommended 19 because their concern was if you made the legal age 25, that group between the ages of 19 and 25 are then probably going to go back to the uh, black market uh, to get their product. And there are not only hazards associated with that, but it also encourages illegal and not uh, often very good uh, influences uh, in terms of who's producing that marijuana. 
So it is a very complicated issue. I'd like to hear from Nick now. Nick, and where are you from, Nick? I'm from Revelstoke. Welcome. Uh, yeah, my question was, why are we only talking about the legalization of marijuana, and why aren't we continuing the discussion about decriminalizing other drugs? Because it's, it's like, I don't know. Well, uh, if I could speak that with Nick, I think, uh, you know, that issue of a broader uh, decriminalization or legalization of, of other substances is something that's starting to become more topic of conversation. Uh, a number of countries in the um, uh, or uh, Organization of the Americas, especially countries from Central and South America, were pushing at the last meeting, I believe, two years ago, to look at a broader uh, legalization, particularly of cocaine, looking at the, the negative impact of the uh, war on drugs on, on their countries. Uh, I would suggest that uh, use it, the, the looking at legalizing marijuana is a, is a start, and that depending on how that experiment uh, unfolds nationally, it may provide a, a platform or a venue for uh, looking at a broader legalization. You know, great, great discussion, and uh, we only have probably about five minutes left in terms of questions, and I want to give our panelists a quick opportunity to to summarize their thoughts, having heard from the constituents that we have. So um, I'd like to hear now from Jim in Elkford. Welcome, Jim. Yes, um, th my question is, if marijuana was legalized, would you be able to smoke it like cigarettes, you know, at a baseball game, or would there be an enclosed area like you would have at a baseball tournament or something, you have a beer garden? Would you have it in an enclosed area like for me personally, I would not want to be hanging around people that are uh, smoking it in public, but in an enclosed or confined area, you know, that's no problem. What would that uh, response be? Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate that. I know um, talking to a number of people, smoking is smoking, and where smoking cigarettes is banned, uh, smoking marijuana should likely be banned as well. Uh, personal opinion. Uh, but have heard that concern from a number of constituents, for sure. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'd like to hear from Cynthia now. Cynthia, where are you calling from this evening? Um, I'm calling from Proctor, and my question was, um, with the legalization, you know, will it be squeezing out the mama and papa growers of the, of the area, and will this have an effect on the economy, um, some effect on the economy of the Kootenays? Certainly part of the, the, the real large questions around who would be allowed to grow it uh, and, uh, and sell it in the end. Uh, absolutely, you know, the concerns, and I'll ask uh, Tamara to speak to it just briefly, uh, certainly are there for small growers and small a businesses. Absolutely I am, and I deal with a number of small growers that due to the nature of their business um, can't expand, can't openly hire people um, because they have fear of um, getting raided or busted and charged and that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, our, our definitely our huge concern is that the government will make legislation open enough that small growers can then rise up and become agricultural um, industry people and not just be considered an underground industry of cannabis. Well, there was a study done, there's several of them that showed that there was approximately 40,000 people within BC that they could find that would openly admit to being employed in the marijuana industry. And that's 40,000 people who are looking to pay tax and get onto the legal side of the system. And if the large growers force that out, that's definitely going to have a negative economic impact on British Columbia, particularly. All right, and our last caller, and then I'll tell you how you can keep asking your questions, uh, is Sh Shannon. So, Shannon, welcome. Oh, hello. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, I come from Revelstoke, a beautiful uh, mountain town with clean, fresh air, and my biggest concern is the air quality. Um, I find it bad enough when you um, are out there, especially with children and someone smoking, and the smell of marijuana is so much worse and it lingers so much longer. I can go for a run in the morning and come across a wall of a terrible smell when I'm out trying to get fresh air in my lungs, and I can't see a soul around. So it's been a bit since they were there, but I've obviously am smelling it. So I am extremely concerned about the air quality issues. 
Mayor Kozak. I couldn't agree with you more, Shannon. Uh, as, said, as we said earlier, I think that the enforcement of no smoking regulations, or it's a provincial law around uh, smoking in public places, and I think that that would apply across the board, whether it's cigarettes or marijuana. So, um, and I think, and I think it's just uh, common courtesy. As Canadians, we are. are usually uh, recognized as very courteous and polite people, and I think that marijuana smoking, well, smokers uh, should should uh, bear that in mind when they're using the product and, and use it um, uh, in a way that's not offending others. So thanks for your call. Thank you, everyone. We're almost at the end of tonight's telephone town hall. It has gone very quickly. Uh, but before I ask our panelists for some very brief closing remarks, I want to remind everyone on the call that you can contact me if you weren't able to get on this evening or if you have uh, thoughts that you want to send my way, you can either email me at wayne.stetsky at parl.gc.ca. And we also have some polling questions for you on our website. If you'd like to see the poll and participate in it, please go to www.waynestetsky.ndp.ca. And I'll, I'll leave the last word to the panelists, but let me just say one thing that I think is really important. Mar recreational use of marijuana is not legal at this point. You'll hear people that because the federal government has said they are going to legalize it, that they can now do that openly. Uh, I have heard the Justice Minister say in Parliament a number of times that uh, they expect, the government expects that the existing laws will be followed until such time as they are changed. So please don't consider this as a uh, an open opportunity. Uh, it is still illegal, and until the law is changed, uh, depending uh, on your police force and where you are, you are subject to, uh, unfortunately, ending up with a criminal record. So, till, quickly, I'll start with Dean, and we'll go around the table and finish with Mayor Kozak. Okay. Thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, you know, clearly, there's a lot of uh, interest and concern uh, from the, the callers around this topic. Uh, again. Uh, as somebody who works in the addiction side of the industry, I see this as a positive move, moving uh, marijuana use away from a criminal framework into a, into a public health framework, and that the, the devil is going to be in the details. Uh, marijuana is a more complex, has more complex issues associated with it than alcohol or tobacco in many ways, <coughs> in terms of uh, how it's going to be distributed. Uh, and uh, I expect that there will, whatever the legislation is going to be, there's going to be changes as it goes on as, as the, the federal government or the provincial government see where some of the bumps in the road are going to be. Uh, and yet, I think this is an important move that we're making. Thanks, Dean. Tamara? Thank you. As a dispensary owner and a contributing uh, economic um, participant, um, I think it's really important that we just continue to push the government toward including independent uh, dispensaries and not taking only the opinion of the licensed producers. And even the folks that drafted up the uh, summary of the task force are all linked in some way to the LPs. And it's a really a concern from our perspective just to ensure that the small growers and the small dispensaries and the people that have been driving this industry, especially in BC, have a voice and still have a place when legalization and legislation comes through. Your Worship. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I'll speak from a local government perspective. Uh, as we move towards legalization, I would agree that this is a positive step forward. I think that it's important that we that we deal with this in a, in a common sense fashion. But my concerns lie with the responsibility that falls to the sho shoulders of local government in terms of enforce enforcement and regulation. Uh, I'm looking to the uh, federal government for uh, uh, some profit sharing as well. And that, by that I mean it will to assist local communities when this becomes legal to be able to uh, have the capacity to deal with it. And to also consult with local governments on how uh, this, this legislation moves forward. I think it's really important that uh, we have control over what happens in our communities and that citizens have a say in what's happening on the ground. Thanks, thanks for inviting me tonight, Wayne. And, and thank you, and I, I stand corrected. Uh, we don't have any poll questions on our website currently, so if you want to provide further input, which I certainly welcome, please email it to me at wayne.stetsky at parl.gc.ca. 
I really want to thank our panel members for being with us this evening. I very much appreciate your time uh, and your involvement in this issue. And for all of you who are on the phone this evening, it's been great to listen to your thoughts and questions. Really appreciate the fact that you took the time to join the call, whether you asked a question or if you just stayed on to listen. This is a very important question for Canadians moving forward. I would encourage all of you to continue to share your thoughts, your concerns, both with me and with the federal government directly. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, you don't even have to put a stamp on your envelope when you're sending it to a member of parliament or to the prime minister. So um, appreciate your concern, your interest, and your time this evening. Thank you very much for joining us on this telephone town hall. Have a great evening.